So we want to introduce a little bit about probability concepts, and there's a number of terms that I want to look at with you today. Um, those of you who had me with pre-calc honors, we did cover a lot of this, these first two lessons last year, um, which is why we're going through it relatively quickly. Um, and then uh, we'll get into totally new stuff in our third lesson of this unit. Um, but just kind of a review here of probability. Remember, probability, we're talking about what are the chances that something will happen. Or in other words, what percent of the time would we expect something in particular to happen? All right, that's another way you can think of probability. Um, there are two main types of, it, of probability. There's the more inductive approach to probability, which we call experimental or empirical probability. And here what we're doing is we're just looking at repeated events in the past. Every time we've had this happen, this has been the outcome, or these have been the outcomes. So as a result, this is what is likely to happen in the future. Okay? Um, this is the type of probability that is used probably most often, I would say, um, particularly in things like sports, um, or even something as simple as what route you take to drive to school or to drive to work. You try a few different routes and you find that this one tends to get you there faster. So then you make the decision to use that route from then on. Okay, when we moved um, over the summer to a new place, we tried a few different routes to get up here you know, in the morning and, and tried to figure out what the best route would be. Um, and finally, we just came to a decision on what seemed to be the fastest route, okay? So we were using some experimental probability. Our chances of getting here fastest will be taking this particular route, okay? Theoretical probability is more a deductive approach. <coughs> You're using some kind of a formula or some kind of logic to come to a calculation of probability um, that may or may not match up with your experimental probability. Okay? Um, now, this is definitely useful, and this can be used in a number, a number of different ways. Uh, for example, one, one way of using this is uh, like finding the area of irregularly shaped objects. One of the things that they'll do, that we can do, is we can put that object in a rectangular space that we know the area of, and then just jump, drop a whole bunch of points on there, okay, randomly. And then we count how many points we have total and how many points lie inside the irregularly shaped object, and that ratio we can use as a theoretical probability and then find the area as a proportion of the whole area of the rectangle, okay? Um, so that's one example, but there's a lot of different areas where we can use theoretical probabilities just to figure out the likelihood of something happening, okay? Now, another term that we want to look at here is the idea of the sample space. This is important that you understand the, the difference between sample space and all the outcomes in a situation, okay? The sample space is all of the possible outcomes, and we're talking about, we're talking about unique outcomes here. Okay, we're talking about unique outcomes. So you could even you could even add that in here. All the possible unique outcomes. A good example of this is like rolling two dice. Okay, 
If you roll two six-sided die, you guys know you could get a roll of one and one and get two. You could roll a six and six and get 12. And you can roll everything between two and 12 as well. Now, those are not all the possible outcomes. Those are all the possible sums. But we might get to that sum different ways. For example, I could roll a 7 with a 1 and a 6, a 2 and a 5, a 3 and a 4. Okay? A lot of different ways. Question? Okay. Um, so when we're talking about sample space, the sample space in that case would be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All right? To look at the different ways that we could get those values, we might set up a table with 1 through 6 on the top and 1 through 6 down the side and then find all the sums. Okay? In fact, later on when you do one of your checkpoint questions, uh, that one of them has to do with that. and You might need to draw that out. Okay? So, all this to say, the number of elements in your sample space, in that case there were 11 elements, that's not always the denominator in your formula for probability. Okay, for example, if I'm calculating what's the probability of rolling a 3, I'm not going to put it out of 11, because there's actually 36 different possible rolls. It's just a lot of those end up giving me the same sum at the end. Okay, but I could roll a 3 if one die is a 1 and one's a 2, or if the first one's a 2 and the second one's a 1. So there's two different ways of doing that. So it would be 2 out of 36. Okay? So that's my sample space. Everyone understand so far? Okay. Now, probability, the basic concept here, this is a ratio of times an outcome is likely to occur. Now, you can give your probability as a ratio or fraction. You can give it as a decimal or a percent as well. If you do that, make sure that you give it to the three significant figures like we do everything else. Uh, however, I will say this. If you are presented with a problem that gives it that gives you all the probabilities as ratios, do not convert them to decimals or percentages, okay? Keep it in what you're given, all right? So That'll ratio, help you keep um, exact values. Ratio meaning like fraction. Fraction, yeah. yeah. Now, if they're all like quarters and you can convert them to decimals and you don't have to round anything, fine. But if you have like three-sevenths or something and you're going to have to round, don't convert that. Okay, or if you have thirds and you're going to make it 0 .333, don't do that, all right? Just leave it as fractions and handle it the way it's given to you, okay? Now, some notation here that P of E, that's just the probability of an event happening. Um, just again, some review here. If our probability is zero, it means that's impossible, if the probability is 1, it means it's guaranteed. It, it absolutely will happen. That's the only outcome that could happen. All right? But all of our probabilities should be somewhere between 0 and 1. Okay? And, of course, to find the probability, we look at how many different ways that event could occur. And by event, we're just talking about an outcome. Um... How many different ways can it occur? And then that's over N of U. N of U is the number in the universal set or the number of possible outcomes in that given situation. Okay? So, again, some more terminology, a little bit of notation. Now let's talk about combining probabilities because this is really where... In the IB, a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, probability questions will address this idea. All right, so we're looking at the probability of a union of two events. Okay, now when you hear union, you need to think either or. Okay, a union is either or.
What's the opposite of the union? Or not opposite, but the other uh, term. Other. Mutually exclusive. Uh, mutually exclusive is another idea. The union was this symbol right here. It's the sideways U, but I don't know. It's the upside down U. Yeah. What's this? That's a great. It's not happening. That's a great hand. No, it's and. Okay, intersection. When you see an intersection, Union was either or, intersection means both have to be true, or both have to occur, okay? Um, so, let me, give you, let me give you an example here, okay? Um, my son's 10 right now. He's kind of tall for his age, so he wants to sit in the front seat of the car. Okay. However, Florida law says that you have to be either, you have to be 100 pounds or 12 years old. Really? To sit in the front seat. Okay. Talk to our friend who's a sheriff's deputy and that's what he was telling us okay so either 100 pounds or 12 years old now so on the left we have 100 pound kids and on the right we have 12 year olds are there some kids who are at least 100 pounds and 12 years old yeah, yeah of course okay there's probably a lot of them okay so right here, this is our intersection, okay? This is a hundred pound, at least a hundred pound kids and 12 years old. Now, notice the law says or, and it's a good thing because we'd probably have a couple of high schoolers who are old enough to drive and still couldn't sit in the front seat because they're not 100 pounds, right? Um, there's probably some of them walking around here. Um, but uh, it's either or. You have to be a certain age or a certain weight in order to qualify. And notice that provides us with a bigger group of people. Okay? The or will always at least be as big as the and, okay? The union will always be at least as big as the intersection, okay? If the two groups intersect completely, then you have the or equaling the and, but that's not that common, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> that's one example, all right? Um, Now, notice, to find the probability of a union, I have to take the probability of the one plus the probability of the other minus the probability of both. Now, why would I have to do that subtraction? Yeah, we would add them twice. Notice, if I took the probability that a kid was 100 pounds... That would include all of this, okay? That would include all of this here. You know, what's the probability that a kid is 100 pounds or that anybody is 100 pounds? But then if I looked at, hey, what's the probability that someone is at least 12 years old and I added that on, that would be adding all of this. Well, you'll notice I added the intersection there twice, okay? So as a result, our formula calls on us to subtract that intersection so we only include it once, okay? Yeah, 
So now we have the idea of mutually exclusive events, all right? These are events that are where it is impossible for them to occur at the same time, okay? It's impossible for them to occur at the same time. Um, for example, let's say we had a deck of cards, okay? We have a deck of cards. <coughs> let's get back to pen, okay? Here are all the black cards. <coughs> and here are all the diamonds. Okay? Now, if you're familiar with a deck of cards, you'll know that all the diamonds are red. Okay? So what's the probability of picking a black diamond? Zero. Zero. Okay? These are mutually exclusive events. It's impossible to pick one card that fits into both of these categories. All right, so if I wanted the probability of getting a black card or a diamond, I could just add the probability of it being black and the probability of it being a diamond. I don't have to subtract because I know the intersection is zero. Okay, so that's what this second, um, this second formula here is talking about. Okay, does that make sense? All right, not a difficult concept, but it's easy to forget in, when you're in the middle of solving a problem. Okay, um, the one thing to look out for that happens when people forget to subtract the intersection is you end up with a probability bigger than one. Okay, if you end up with a probability of like 115%, that ought to be, you know, setting off alarm bells in your head. You know, something's wrong here. Okay, and hopefully that'll, uh, hopefully that'll help you catch your mistake. Okay? All right. Um, the last thing we have here is the complement principle. Complement principle. If you cover up the ment at the end and add a te, you have the word complete, okay? You have complete, all right? Complement, this isn't like saying somebody looks nice or anything. This is complete, all right? This is a principle of completeness. If you have a sample space and you've accounted for everything that you're supposed to in your sample space, then your probabilities ought to add up to 100%. Okay? If they don't, then you've missed something. Now, you can turn any situation into a binomial type of a situation. Okay? Where it's this event or not this event. And what you're doing there is you're looking at them in terms of a complement. All right, so um, going back to the example there, if you're, again, if you're familiar with the deck of cards with diamonds, all right, I could look at the probability of having a diamond, the probability of having a club, probability of having a spade, probability of having a heart, okay? That's not complement here. The complement would be, I have the probability of having a diamond, and I have the probability of not having a diamond. So it could be any of the other three. And we don't care what it is. It's just not a diamond. So the notation we use here is this little prime. A prime is how we read this, okay? And that's just saying everything that is not that event, okay, or that outcome. And the reason why this is useful is because something happening and something not happening will always have probabilities that add up to 100%. Okay? Yeah. Today, it is either going to rain or not rain. There's no, like, middle ground there. Okay? It's either or. So I know, I know it's a 100% chance of either raining or not raining today. Okay? Um, and if I know it's a 35% chance of rain, I know it's a 65% chance of not raining, because it's 100% minus that. 
So how do we use this? Okay. Well, here, here we have an example where you know we have a, a standard deck of cards, fifty-two cards. What's the probability of getting at least two aces if you're dealt five cards? Okay. Well, if I was figuring this out, the probability of at least two aces, I could find out by doing this. The probability of exactly two plus the probability of exactly three plus the probability of exactly four plus the probability of exactly five, which would be what? Zero, because there's only four aces in the deck. All right? But I'd have to figure out four different probabilities and then add them all together, right? Okay? Now, on the other hand, what events would I have where I did not have at least two aces? One, two. I either have exactly one or I don't have any, all right? Now, that's only two probabilities I'd have to figure out as opposed to four. So if I figured those out, I could do one minus the probability of no aces plus the probability of one ace. I'm using the complement principle here. Okay? Here I have greater than or at least two aces. Here I have not at least two aces. Okay? Or less than two aces. Okay? Now, in that case, we're doing two probabilities as opposed to four. But think about it even further than this. Let's say that we had something that we had 55 of. Or something happened 55 times. And we want the probability that a certain outcome happened at least three times. Okay? Maybe we're uh, uh, producing something. Okay? We're, we're manufacturing something. And um, if we have at least three failures or faulty products out of 55, we got to shut everything down and figure out what's going on. Okay? So if everything's perfect, or if we only have one faulty product or only two faulty products, it's okay, we can keep going. But if we hit that third one, you know, we got an issue and we got to we got to um, stop everything and restart. So, if I wanted the probability of getting at least 3 faulty uh, products, I'd have to find the probability of 3 and 4 and the probability of 5, and probability of 6, and 7, and 8, all the way up to 55. And I'd have to add those, you know, 52 different probabilities up. Okay, so I'd have to find 52 probabilities, I'd have to add them all up. If I use the complement principle instead, I could just find, okay, well, what's the probability of having two or fewer? Because that would be the complement of having at least three. Okay? And then I'm just finding, hey, what's the probability of having 0, 1, or 2? I add that up and subtract from 100%. And now I know the probability of getting at least 3. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay. So that's our idea with the complement principle. Um, anytime you hear this idea of at least, at least, consider the idea that you might want to use a complement. All right? Now, some cases it won't make any difference. For example, if they said at least three aces, you're either finding zero, one, and two and subtracting, or you're doing three, four, and five and adding them up. Really isn't any more work either way. Okay? But uh, other times, the complement can definitely be helpful. Okay? One last thing here. We're not actually finding these probabilities because in the IB, the things that we did last year in pre-cal honors of using combinations where we would have done, okay, I want 
two out of the four aces, and I, and that means I want three out of the other uh, 48 cards. And then those can occur, um, you know, those can occur in multiple different ways, and then it's over, 52, choose five. We're not doing that here. Okay? We're not doing that here. Um, with IB, they're more concerned with you being able to work with the probabilities than actually finding the original probabilities. And part of that is because so much of our probability stuff is, not, is going to be based on experimental, not the theoretical. Using the combinations and permutations was all the theoretical probability. Uh, Real-world applications are much more commonly going to use experimental. Okay? So that's going to be our focus here. All right.